Okay, uh, on to example number six. So for example number six, what we're gonna do is we're gonna prove that two functions are inverses of each other. So rather than you know taking a function f of x and then applying the operations of inverse to see if it's g of x and then doing the same with g of x to f of x, um, the only way to prove that two functions are inverses of each other is to use what we call in the composition. So basically, as I kind of wrote in the notes here, if I compose, let's zoom in here, let's do one more. If I take f of g of x, and that gives me the identity element x, then that better equal g of f of x if those two functions are inverse of each other. And then again, this kind of goes back to you know, understanding that identity element goes back to our understanding of the warm up. Like, if you remember, like we had that initial number. Now, the first example I did, we always ended up with three, but I also talked about the example of ending up with the number that you're thinking of in your head. And that's kind of like your identity element. So you can think about like the function is applying the operations to that initial number or that identity element. And then the inverse function is undoing all of those elements or all of those processes to the identity element. So therefore, each way when you apply the function and then the inverse or when you apply the inverse and then the function each way you're going to be able to get the identity element x so that's what we're going to do in this case is prove that our functions are inverses of each other by using composition because they're going to both get the identity element x and that's a if or only if um, kind of way that we can prove that uh, to a function and it are if two functions are inverses of one another all right so to go ahead and do that um, first one, I'll just kind of use the notation here. So let's go ahead and check f of g of x. Okay, so basically I remember from composition that basically, basically means I'm going to take the g of x function and plug it into my f of x function. So therefore that's going to look like um, 3 times g of x minus 2. All right, now again, g of x is x plus 2 divided by 3. So we have g of x defined. So therefore, I'm going to replace g of x with x plus 2 over 3 minus 2. Okay, and now we just need to use some simplifying, and we just want to make sure we're simplifying using the order of operations here. Um, you can, you know, go ahead and... Uh, see that here this is a 3 in the numerator times a 3 in the denominator you could take that 3 out you know however you want to um, but you can see that these 3's are going to divide to 1 so therefore it's just going to left leave me with an x plus 2 minus 2 and then obviously x plus 2 minus 2 is just going to leave me with x okay so good that way let's go ahead and verify that g of f of x works as well so again in this case now I'm going to take the f of x function and plug it into g of x so that would look something like this uh, plus 2 over 3. Okay, and f of x we have defined here as uh, x, what is it, x, 3x minus 2. So therefore I'm going to replace that with 3x minus 2. Now I'm going to use parentheses just to remind myself that that is what I am plugging in to the function. Um, the parentheses can easily kind of go away because it's not like subtraction or multiplication that we need to apply there. We can just, you know, there's really nothing else that we need here for this grouping. Um, so therefore, I can just see that without these parentheses, if I just wanted to go ahead and uh, erase them, then the negative 2 plus 2 is going to give me 0. So that's going to leave me with a 3x over 3, which divides into x. So therefore, you can see the composition both ways um, proves x. And then what I did, also I provided you with a link to Desmos where I uh, put these two graphs in there. So therefore, you can see that also they have the symmetry about the y equals x line. And we'll go and visit those graphs um, after I'm done with all three examples. All right, so let's go and get into cubic one. And then this is kind of where, again, the parentheses now actually would be important. So I think it's just a good habit to get into that. Um, now, rather than go ahead and writing in like this notation, I'm just going to skip that step and I'm going to immediately go to like the next step. So, but we'll still write out. First thing is let's do f of g of x. So therefore, I'm at least describing what process that I am um, showing you. So f of g of x, that means I'm going to plug the g of x function into the f of x function. So that would look something like this the cube root of 1 minus x cubed. 
Okay. Now notice that the cube root of something cubed is going to undo each other. Those are inverse operations. But here comes the important thing. Um, and I actually made a mistake here when I was working out this problem. You got to make sure that you still understand you're still subtracting this expression. So even the cube root and cube undo, but then you have the expression inside the parentheses one minus X. And I wasn't paying attention and I didn't use parentheses and I just did one minus one and I got negative X. And I was like, Oh, what? what happened there? What did I do there? And it took me a while to understand, oh, I forgot to include those parentheses because you're subtracting the whole expression. So you just got to be careful or not rush through doing your examples, right? <laughs> like me. Um, so anyways, when I distribute that, I now get one minus one plus X, which just gives me my identity element X. All right. So now let's go and do the other way. So we can do G of F of X. Okay, so now I'm going to plug my f of x function into my g of x. So therefore, I'm going to have the cube root of 1 minus. Now again, I'm going to make sure I use my parentheses here because I am subtracting the quantity. So I want to make sure that um, I have parentheses. I'm not subtracting 1. I'm subtracting the quantity 1 minus x cubed. That helps me because now I can distribute that. So now that I distribute that negative using distributive property, I have one minus one plus X cubed. Well, one minus one is just zero. So I'm just left with the cube root of X cubed, which equals X. Okay. So there we go. Got the identity element for both compositions. So we're good to go. All right, now let's have some fun with rational functions. Um, so this one we'll, we'll, we'll discuss a little bit more. Um, what we're gonna end up with is a complex fraction, which we will discuss more um, later on in this course. But this is a good kind of a, um, leeway into that. And also some things that we've kind of already talked about that you know you should have um, prior, prior knowledge from what we've discussed in this chapter to be able to uh, simplify this. So let's work on the first composition, f of g of x. And again, it doesn't matter which one you do first. You can do either one. All right, so if I am going to apply this composition, I'm going to plug my g of x function. So I'm going to take 2x plus 3 divided by x minus 1. And then I'm going to add that to 3 all over 2x plus 3 uh, divided by x minus 1 minus 2. Now you could apply that, you could apply parentheses, which you know I keep on telling you to do. Um, but in this case, you realize that they're not necessary. You're not like subtracting here, you know, from that quantity um, or having some kind of multiplier. So, you know, the parentheses, if you wrote them in there, that's fine, but then you'd quickly erase them to saying that you don't really need them. All right, so in this case though, we have a little bit of an issue. So we have this that looks extremely confusing and difficult. And the reason being is we have fractions in the numerator and fractions as a denominator. So the best thing to do when you have fractions, especially if you don't like fractions, is to get rid of the fractions. And the way to do that is to multiply by your common denominator. So I'm going to make sure I write every single expression as a fraction. So since these are just integers, I can put them over one. Therefore, I notice that the common factor, or sorry, the common denominator of all of my fractions is x minus 1. So to get rid of them, I'm going to multiply everything times x minus 1. And we did that previously um, in our composition, uh, composition lesson when we were learning to you know, solve for a variable or the inverse. Sorry, we did that previously in this in this section when we were trying to get to you know, solve for the variable in the denominator. We multiplied by that denominator on both sides. Well, in this case, we're not trying to solve for the variable, but what we're going to do is we're going to same kind of idea. We're going to multiply by the denominator. Now I'm putting these in parentheses because you're going to multiply everything by your common denominator. So rather than multiplying X minus one, you know, showing that to each one, I'm going to put this in parentheses and then put, and then put this outside of it. And what that's mathematically telling me or telling you is that I'm going to multiply everything times X minus one. Now you have to do it on the top and the bottom to produce equivalent um, fractions. What we did previously was we multiplied on both sides to produce equivalent equations, right? Because we don't want to change the equation or change the fraction. As long as you multiply the same number or expression on the top and the bottom, you're not changing the value of that fraction. And just, you know, kind of quick little excerpt. If I have one half and I multiply by four, <laughs> get four. I hate my fours. What if I multiply by three over three? Well, then I get three over six, which is still one half, right? So as long as I'm multiplying by X minus one on top and bottom, I'm good. All right. So let's kind of go over here and see what happens. So when I multiply X minus one times this fraction, notice that I have an X minus one in the numerator 
and an x minus 1 in the denominator, which are going to divide to 1, leaving me just with 2x plus 3. And then I have x minus 1 times 3. Well, I can apply the distributive property with that. So when I do that, I would get 3x minus 3. Okay, in, uh, in the next section here, I'm going to do x minus 1 times this fraction. Again, that's just going to give me 2x plus 3 as the x minus 1s divide to 1. And then I have x minus 1 times negative 2. Again, apply distributive property, so I get a negative 2x plus 2. Okay, so now let's go ahead and, and combine our like terms here. So I have 2x plus 3x is going to be 5x. 3 minus 3 is just 0. 2x minus 2x is 0, and then 3 plus 2 is 5, and you can see that that gives me my identity element x. Perfect. All right, so now let's go ahead and do the other way around. So that one was, let's do g of f of x. Okay, to do g of f of x, I'm going to plug the f of x function, which is x plus 3 over x minus 2. Now here, I'm going to want to use my parentheses because I have a multiplication, right? So it's x plus 3 over x minus 2, if I remember it correctly, x plus 3, x minus 2, good. So that's 2x plus 3 over, now x, but I'm going to insert this, x plus 3 over x minus 2, and then what's that's minus 1, yeah, sorry. Okay, so you can put this again in parentheses, but again, it's not really going to be affecting anything in this case. Um, so now we have a different common denominator. Now you can see my common denominator of all of my terms here is x minus 2. So I'm going to do, I'm going to apply the same process. I'm going to multiply everything times x minus 2 on the top and the bottom. Now you could distribute that 2 if you wanted to, but, um, you know, it, I don't see that as um, really help simplifying anything at this moment. We'll just wait till we do the math um, and we'll get to that point. Okay, so when I distribute the x minus 2, remember you got to distribute it to both terms since they're separated by addition and subtraction. So when I multiply x minus 2 times this fraction, the x minus 2 divides out and I'm just left with 2 times x plus 3. So now I'll go ahead and distribute it. So that's 2x plus 6. And then I have x minus 2 times 3 which is going to give me a positive 3x minus 6. And then in my denominator here, when I multiply x minus 2 times this, I am just going to be left with x plus 3. And then when I do x minus 2 times a negative 1, make sure you keep that negative symbol, that's going to give me a negative x plus 2. All right, so simplify this. I get 2x plus 3x is 5x. 6 minus 6 is 0, so I'm left with, again, 5x. My denominator, x minus x is 0, and 3 plus 2 is 5. And therefore, that goes again and simplifies to x. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. That is um, the process when you are asked to prove that two functions are inverses of each other. And again, the idea of composition is really you know, applying one operation and then applying uh, the inverse op or applying the reverse operations, which is known as the inverse. And when you apply that, you know, process and then the inverse process, you should get the identity element. Or if you apply the inverse process and then the process, you need to get the identity element. And that is the whole idea of, of inverse functions and as well as be able to prove. So that is basically the roundup of what is important for the inverse functions. And that is the conclusion for our functions unit. Thanks.